Thank you so much, you guys. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. If you'd like to take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 2, uh, that's where we're going to be this morning. My Bible is not going to stay open, so I'm going to close it right now. We'll get there later. Um, today, we're, like I said, we're going to be looking at a passage from Philippians. And Philippians was written by Paul late on in his ministry and from prison, if you remember that. It's a familiar book, and this passage we're going to be looking at is a familiar passage. When you think of Philippians, the commands maybe to rejoice come to mind. Paul encourages the Philippians to rejoice in any circumstances, even to rejoice in sufferings. You may remember the encouragement to think on things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, etc. You may remember Paul's confident exclamation, I can do all things through Christ. There's a lot in Philippians that we know, that we love. And Paul's relationship with the Philippians, as you read through it, is so loving, so friendly, so uh, like, like a loving father, like a really, really good coach who loves his team, who loves his kids, and is pushing them on to bigger and better things. And this passage, it's an encouragement, an exhortation, a challenge issued from this coach, this father, to go beyond the ordinary, to go beyond the regular, to go beyond uh, the status quo. Every good father, every good coach knows that when, when, you, have, when you have potential, when you have an opportunity, you, you have to push your players, you have to push your kids. That's, that's, what, that's where growth happens. Paul's not asking for ordinary from the Philippians. And if we will accept this passage, if we'll dive into what Paul's asking, he's not asking for ordinary from us either. So let's read chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from His love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, Working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. How many of us have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had? Man, the attitude of Christ, this, this attitude, we must have the attitude of Christ. Paul isn't looking for normal love or normal obedience. He isn't asking hard hearts to accept the good news. He's going deeper than all that. He's asking for something intense. He's asking for a serious attitude. And we've probably all been told that we have an attitude. And parents, you know that when you say that your children have an attitude, it means they have a bad attitude, right? The word attitude means bad attitude. But I just want to wanna try to disarm that word really quickly, okay? We all know that we are supposed to have an attitude, right? There's an attitude we're supposed to have. It's obviously not a bad one. But we're all supposed to have an attitude. And actually, we know that sometimes it's good for people to share a collective attitude, and that's what we call vision. That's what we call vision. And we're going to be talking about that all of next month. And that's part of the reason I wanted to talk about this passage. is because we, as a people, as a group, we have to share an attitude together. Or the things that we are going to be talking about for the next month are not going to happen. We have to pick up a vision together. And so that's what Paul is asking for. He's asking for his people to pick up an attitude together. When I, was in, in, when I was in high school, when I was young, I played soccer a lot. And I played, actually got to play with the same guys for like five years in a row, which was amazing. And the, between the second and third year, the second year, I remember this very vividly, we didn't like each other. Uh, we didn't want to play together. We didn't want to work out together. Uh, we, didn't, we weren't playing for each other. We were playing for ourselves. And honestly, our coach was just a, not a nice guy. None of us wanted to be around him. We couldn't learn from him, and he didn't want to teach us. 
and we lost all the time. We lost all the time. And the next year, we got a year older, obviously, but so did everybody that we played against. But our coach was gone. We had a new coach. And there was this new energy, this new attitude that came. And we wanted to hang out with each other. We wanted to do extra workouts. We wanted to run extra. We wanted to do all these things that a 14-year-old doesn't usually want to do. But it was because this coach brought a new attitude. He brought a new vision. He brought a new thing to our team. And we started winning. We started, like, succeeding together and loving each other. Philippians 2 is a request from a spiritual coach to put on an attitude together. To pick up a, a championship mentality in a way. God wants us to pick up an attitude. So what's this attitude? We're Americans. We know what champions look like. <laughs> champions, that's funny, guys. That was a joke. Champions, they have tenacity, ambition, competitiveness, a chip on their shoulder, and they want to do stuff together. Our experience tells us that those things are normal and good, but Philippians 2 gives us an attitude that is extremely unnatural. It is not those things. It feels backwards, counterintuitive, like you're stepping up to bat and they ask you to switch hands. That's how it feels. It feels wrong and off. This attitude is going to go against our sin nature. It's going to go against what we've been taught by our culture. And this attitude, we have blind spots to it at every turn. But this passage builds support for us to fight against our sin nature, against our natural tendencies, against our culture, against our blind spots, and put on the attitude that God wants us to put on. So the first piece of this attitude is humility. The first piece is humility. Verse 3 says, don't be selfish, don't try to impress others, be humble. Who am I really? That's the question that humility answers. Who am I really? Reality is the basis of humility. If I learned anything from Brad in my time in youth group, it's that. That reality is the basis of humility. I'm not, Paul is not, the Bible is not asking you to be something that you're not. It's actually because we have a warped sense of reality that we have pride. <laughs> it's not because, not, the Bible's not asking us to be something that we're not. It's asking us to receive the reality about what we truly are. Let me read you some words that the Bible says about you and about me before Jesus. They're not nice, by the way. Dead. Dust. Led around by the devil. Asleep. Deaf. Wicked, unrighteous, blind, adulterous, condemned. That's what the Bible says that you and I are before Jesus comes into our lives. Where's the, where's the pride there? Who am I with Christ? Let me read you some promises. We are justified. Seen by God just as if we'd never sinned. That's what justified means. We are adopted, put into the family of God. We're led by the Spirit. We have a guide and a mentor and a comforter and a helper with us. We're seated in the heavenly places. We're safe and secure even in death. We're holy. God is able to have a relationship with us because he's given us a new nature. We're the temple of God. God dwells in us. We're at peace with God. No more condemnation. No more war. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit so we're safe. <laughs> and there's countless other promises. Just turn the pages. But what did you do to earn that? What did you do to gain that standing? What did you do to be moved from darkness to light? Nothing. We are justified, adopted, made holy because of Christ alone. And humility acknowledges that reality. That reality. That's, that is the reality. Again, the Bible's not. I'm not. We're not asking us to be something that we're not. Humility asks us to acknowledge reality and live like it. Ultimately, that's what humility is. It's reality. You cannot read these lists and puff yourself up and pat yourself on the back and look down your nose at other people. You just can't. But you also can't read these lists and call yourself garbage. <laughs> you, you can't read these lists and read worthless. You can't. You have intrinsic value because Jesus says you do. That's reality. Each one of us. And as we are moving on, as we're receiving vision, as we're, as we're moving forward into a new season as a church, 
you are valuable. We need you. And that's what humility acknowledges. True humility brings freedom. Freedom from a lot of things. Freedom from self-promotion. Verse 3 says, don't try to impress others. We don't feel the need to talk about ourselves, to talk about our accomplishments, to assert ourselves into every single conversation. We will be able to appreciate our accomplishments, ours or someone else's, just the same. Not concerned about whether our brother and sister in Christ is passing us up in something, even if that's their intention. Even if they mean to do that, even if they mean to assert themselves, we don't have to. Because Jesus Christ is the one who accomplished the work, because Jesus is our maker and our fulfiller, then Jesus and the cross of Jesus is our only boast for ourselves and for our brothers and sisters. How does humility accomplish this? Well, in what amounts to essentially a summary of the two lists that I gave you, Tim Keller says this, We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. More sinful than we ever dreamed, but more loved than we ever hoped. So where is the room for the offended spirit? Where is the room for the self-promotion? It's gone with humility. We are known completely and loved fully. That produces humility. So let's pick up humility. That's the first thing. Let's pick up humility. Let's pick up the attitude of Christ and let's pair it with the next step that Philippians 2 gives us. And that is sacrifice. Oh boy. Out of humility comes sacrifice. Sacrifice is actually, uh, I believe, an expression of humility. Sacrifice is humility in motion. Jesus, of course is our ultimate example of sacrifice. This passage goes on to lay out, and we'll get there more, but he goes on to lay out what Jesus did out of the overflow of his humility. I want to stress the connection between humility and sacrifice. Out of the overflow of his humility, that's what verse 6, 7, and 8 say, out of the overflow of Jesus' humility, he went to the cross. Out of the overflow of his humility, he died on the cross. That is sacrifice. He was willing more than willing to pay the price to make us right with God. He was willing to lay aside everything in order to bring us home. Jesus knew the cost. He knew the price of this extremely extravagant love and sacrifice. He knew what it would cost him. But he was willing to pay that price because he loved us so dearly. And because, Philippians 2 tells us, because of his humility. Hebrews explained that he did this out of the joy that was set before him. He calls it joy to make this sacrifice. So I want to ask you guys, when you look at people in need, when you look at maybe single moms, when you look at homeless people, the needy people in our communities and in our church, are you willing to sacrifice for them? Do you love them with this real, active, powerful love that acknowledges that without Christ, you are no different? (laughs) That without Christ, you're in the gutter. That without Christ, you're condemned. You acknowledge that. Does that compel you to sacrifice for people? When you look at the cross, does it compel you? Our motivation for sacrifice comes from Jesus Christ. And if we don't have the right motivation, we will be sacrificing in order to build ourselves up. And I want to try to give you a quick example, but I know I do this all the time. Um, Didn't you see how I gave up my chair? (laughs) Didn't you see how while everyone else was having a good time, I was like, I'm going to wash the dishes. Did you see how I did that, guys? Isn't that amazing that I would do that? When our motivation for sacrifice comes from our own wanting to be acknowledged and wanting to be recognized. That's that's dangerous. That's dangerous. But when our desire to sacrifice comes from acknowledging that Jesus died on the cross to make us right with him, out of a joy that was set before him, 
our, our sacrifice, our, the things we give up, the Saturdays we surrender, our joy. If I'm not compelled to sacrifice for the sake of the lost, for the sake of the people in my community, for the sake of the hurting and the broken around me, I wonder if I understand the cross. I wonder if I understand what happened there. Our natural tendency is toward greed. It is. We naturally look out for ourselves. We naturally want the best for ourselves. We're often blind to the needs of others. But what the Bible says about sacrifice, and this is, this is beautiful and I hope that we don't miss this. What the Bible says about sacrifice and what the Bible says about the reward for those who sacrifice. What the, what the Bible says about those who take up their cross and follow Jesus is something far beyond what we can imagine or hope, or dream to gain in this life. 2 Corinthians calls it an eternal weight of glory. Jesus calls it a pearl of great price. And in Revelation, we are given God himself as our reward. The Christian life is not the, the life of the ascetic. It's not about no reward. It's not about no happiness. It's about sacrificing and giving up for the ultimate happiness. There is a reward. There is a prize. A sacrificial attitude recognizes that true satisfaction doesn't come through greed. Jim Elliot said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. We know his story. We know what he was willing to give up to gain what he couldn't lose. Elizabeth Elliot lived it after him, continuing on in that ministry, giving up something she couldn't keep to gain what she could never lose. The reward and the prize for the Elliots and for the saints and for the, for the other people that were with them far outweighed what was going to be gained by a comfy couch and a nice job. <laughs> Verse 4 simply says, don't look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. That's the easiest way to explain sacrifice. That's the, that's the, that's the one sentence answer. Don't just look out for yourself, care for others. This seems almost like a kindergarten sentence. Just share, guys. Just share. <laughs> but the Elliots, and there are people in this church that I've seen that live that. They don't just look out for themselves. They look out for the interests of others. So are you willing to sacrifice? This is how community is made possible, by the way, and that's what we're moving into. If you're not willing to sacrifice and look out for the needs of others in your community, you don't have community. If you're not willing to sacrifice and look out for your brothers and sisters, you don't have community. Sacrifice leads to community. So, first, let's pick up humility. And then let's pick up sacrifice that gets breathed out by this humility. And the last element that sacrifice leads into is community. Humility produces sacrifice, and sacrifice produces community. This passage just breathes community. You read the whole thing. It says, agree with each other, love each other, live in peace together, look out for everyone's needs, be humble. All of these words breathe life into community, to family. We are supposed to pick up this attitude together. Yes, you must be humble. Yes, you must be willing to sacrifice. But not only one of us can look out for the needs of everyone. Not just one person can complete the joy and carry the weight that Jesus carried. Right? This is a vision that has to get picked up by everyone. Everyone has been specifically, uniquely, divinely designed to serve the community that you're a part of. Each one of you has something irreplaceable to offer. So it's not just five people to be humble, five people to sacrifice. It's everyone. We have to do it together. Normally, this is where our blind spots pop up. We think of our character traits as ways for us to build ourselves up, right? I'm like this, so I might as well do that. That's, that's what I'm here for. This is natural. It really is. 
if someone is practical, good with their hands, they might think, well, I could become a carpenter so I can have a good job and make some money. That's, that's, the, that's the line of thinking. There's, not, there's no holes in that. That's the line of thinking. I am able to do this, so I will continue to do this, and that will be a, that, that's good enough. But what this passage and what the whole New Testament is asking us to do is look out for others. So if that same practical, good-with-their-hands person looks outside of themselves, they could see what they could, that they could use their gift to help build a, home, build a home or a shed for a brother or sister in need. I Just share a quick story. He's not in this room right now, so he doesn't have to blush or anything. But I have a very good friend named Daniel Yoder, and he's a carpenter. And I uh, am a disaster with a tool. Uh, it doesn't matter what tool. It doesn't matter what task. It's not going to go well. Uh, I need people to help me. And over the last couple years, I've um, been trying to make the house that my wife and I live in um, livable. And that requires help and tools and stuff. And so Daniel Yoder has on many, many occasions and many, many times, without any thought that I would pay him back, without any thought that I would be able to help him in any way, shape, or form ever, He has given up weekends, he's given up time to help me. To make sure that my wife and I don't freeze to death in our house. To make sure that there's like baseboard that doesn't have all the nasty holes and stuff in it when you hit it with hammers on accident. You know, these kind of things that that Daniel has been willing to do for me. Because Daniel and I are part of a community together. Because we love each other. Because I need him. And hopefully someday he'll need me for something. And I'll be able to help. <laughs> but ultimately, that's, that's what it's about. Is being willing to give up an hour. Being willing to, to give up a skill. To give it to somebody else. Being willing to drop everything and, and go, go help your brother. Go help your sister. Being willing to give up an evening to watch their kids so that they can spend time together, maybe. I I don't know. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know every detail. I know for me, I needed a fireplace. And Daniel was willing to help. I don't know what it's going to be. But are you willing? When a person who's gifted and influencing people uses their gift to get ahead or manipulate someone or to puff themselves up, they're looking out for their own interest. When a person uh, is, is capable of, of anything, they use it for themselves. Like, are we looking out for our brothers and sisters who are in need? This is the command. Be a community that shares the same mindset. Be a community that picks up the same attitude. Imagine for a moment what it would be like, just imagine for a moment, what would it be like if you could only rely on yourself? Imagine imagine a world in which you had to do everything yourself. No car repair shops. No contractors to help build and repair your home. No teachers to teach you when you were a kid. No teachers to teach your kids now. Who would you be? Would you be able to hold the world together? No, of course not. And no one expects you to either. Now imagine a a community of people, normal people, plumbers, mechanics, teachers, doctors, baristas, etc., who who personified sacrificial love, born from humility, born from the reality of our standing with Christ, Do you you see how this works together? Do you see how that comes together? How that attitude lives and breathes and moves? You cannot meet all of your needs on your own. And neither can your neighbor. But you and your neighbor and their neighbor and their neighbor and their neighbor together can meet each other's needs. That's what community is all about. One of the Wesleys don't remember which one, said that the New Testament knows nothing of solitary religion. The New Testament knows nothing of solitary religion. 
The New Testament knows nothing of solitary religion. We're not supposed to do this alone. And that's wonderful. That's amazing. We're not supposed to do this alone, and God doesn't expect us to. Okay, so it's time to pick it up. It's time to put on this attitude. How do we start? What do we do? First, this is difficult. Ask people to speak into your own blind spots. Where is pride bubbling up? Where is greed bubbling up? Where is hoarding time and and hoarding energy and hoarding effort? Where is that popping up? Your, Your friends probably know. Your spouse probably knows. Ask them to speak into your blind spots. Pride, unfortunately, is like a pair of glasses. Levi Stephan told me this once. Pride is like a pair of glasses. It's really, you see through it, and it's really easy to see glasses on other people, but you don't really notice them when they're on your own face. Pride's like that. You see through it, you see it on other people's faces, but you don't really notice it when you're wearing them. That's pride. So I'd really encourage you, ask people to speak into your blind spots. Next, ask yourself, are you grasping the depth of sacrifice that Jesus made to bring you into his family? Are, are you grabbing onto what the cross really means? Are you grabbing onto the truth that we're dead and dust and condemned and alone without Jesus, but with him, justified, adopted, holy? Can we grab onto that? Because if you're not grasping that, this, is not, this isn't going to work. That's where it all starts. The gospel is where all of this begins and ends. And, and if, 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 we, if we aren't grabbing onto that, we can't have the rest. And third, think specifically about what's coming up in our church family. Change is coming. And I don't mean that in a big, scary, weird way. But change is coming. Things are going to look a little different. There's a building being built right there. There's a new pastor coming on soon. There are new songs on the stage. There are new ministries popping up. Your kids are growing up. There are new issues that we need to face as a community together. New questions that we haven't had to answer for a while. Are you ready to get in the game? Like Mike said last week, remember? Mike said, we need to get in the game together. Are you, are you ready? Will you sacrifice your Sunday evenings in October to come pray with your church family? I know that's a lot but I think it's going to be worth it. I really do believe it's going to be worth it. Will you sacrifice Sunday evenings? Are you ready to humble, to be humble and to be sacrificial and to be communal, even if you don't like the songs, even if you think the building's stupid? Will you be humble? Will you be willing to sacrifice? Will you be willing to pick up an attitude together and just go and just love? We've been told to, to all our lives to, to, to drop the attitude. <laughs> but it's time to pick one up. It's time to put a new one on. And before we end, this is how we're going to conclude. But just look at how these, things, how these three things come together, okay? Go to verse six, seven, 6 to 11. Let me read this poem for you. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus' ultimate expression of humility, he gave up heaven. He put aside equality with God, it says. Jesus' ultimate expression of humility 
led to the ultimate expression of sacrifice, which was him dying on the cross. And it will lead, don't miss this, to the ultimate expression of community when every single one of us, every tribe and tongue and nation is around the throne singing the same song together. Humility produced that sacrifice. And that sacrifice produced a community that is, that is so beautiful. Every tribe and tongue and nation, people from every corner of the world and from all time are going to be around the throne singing holy, holy, holy. That's what this is about. That's why we're together. That's why we're here. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's something I want to be a part of. And we get to be a part of it now. A foretaste of glory, right? That's what we're diving into. Let me pray. Father, we cannot do this alone. We cannot be humble and on our own. We can't sacrifice for our brothers and sisters on our own. Community is hard on our own. But we have something in common. Something beyond the building, something beyond the music, something beyond the leadership, something beyond everything. We have you in common. We have the same spirit living inside of us. We have been baptized into the same spirit together. Jesus, would you make that the thing we think about first? Would you make that the thing that binds us together? Would you make that the center of our unity? Not our tastes, not our preferences, not our opinions, but our right standing with you. Father, we love you. Jesus, we love you. And Spirit, we need you so bad. Would you move in us? to be humble, to be sacrificial, and to love community. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.